Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We're running just a few minutes late as we get people registered and seated. I appreciate your patience and welcome to the Enneagram and Grace. And we'll start shortly. It will begin shortly.
ever, um, please feel free to do so. Now we're going to nice get started. What a God thing. I can't believe it. I know. Which is yeah. Okay, Corey. Yeah. You do. Okay. Welcome, everybody. We still need just about a minute or so to get started, and um, you're in for a real treat because I am just as much the student in this process as I am the teacher. This is an area of the Enneagram that I've um, spent a lot of time learning about. And so I'm going to share with you um, some of what I've learned about the Enneagram and Grace. Um, our event today will uh, have a lot of music and um, some exercises and experiences that I'm going to offer you. Um, because we're live streaming, that means that those of you who are on your own watching, and thank you so much for joining us, will need to take the time to, to do that on your own. We're on a pretty uh, strict uh, timetable this morning, so we're going to go ahead and get started. So um, if you have, if you're live streaming, if you have a way or a ritual or would like to light a candle for yourself or for the world or for anyone else, I invite you to do that, to bring in some light into your own life and into this experience today. Um, or whatever ritual, if you have a prayer that you'd like to start with. I'm just going to take a moment of silence and then we'll get started. So we're going to begin with a meditation, and I would like you to all find a space where you're seated, where you feel very comfortable. Allow your legs and feet to be supported by the floor. And take your attention and place it on your breath. Allow the seat to support you. Straighten your back. And now drop your attention to your belly. And take your breathing in and down, all the way into your belly. And breathe at a pace that's comfortable for you. Focusing on both your inhale and exhale. And once you've established a pace that feels comfortable for you, take your attention with your eyes still closed and place it on the back wall. And now move your attention with your eyes still closed to the front of the room. Now move your attention to a book length in front of your face. Relax into compassionate, non-judgmental space. Gently tethering your attention to this moment right now.
Return to your breath. Place your attention in your belly. <coughs> Return your attention to your breath. And just be with yourself and your breathing. And when you're ready, gently return your attention to the room and your seat. and open your eyes and just sit quietly. Awareness is essential. Awareness requires us to be awake. Awareness is a component of grace because grace is a field that is always around us. It has never left and yet we lose sight of grace. We're going to talk about grace from a, a pretty non-religious and secular place today um, as grace being a field of energy versus something that comes to us from a supreme being. But as we move into that place, I'd like you to consider where your attention is. And just gently, as you've relaxed through meditation, consider what emotions you might be experiencing right now. What thoughts do you have about being here? And what kind of thoughts or judgments do you have about the thoughts that you have? Or what conclusions have you made about the thoughts that you have? And then gently shift your attention to what you would like, how you would like that to be. Is there a shift? Is there a change that you'd like? And if so, set that as your intention for the next couple of hours that we're going to spend together. So this workshop was originally going to be a full day workshop and I had a dream and the dream told me that rather than offering this for continuing education and making this a full day workshop, this information, just introductory information about grace and my study about grace really just needed to be provided to everybody. So we shortened the, I shortened the workshop. and and created a concise, kind of packed version of what ultimately um, will be a much longer workshop in the future. Today we're going to talk about what grace is and why it's important, the relationship between grace and gratitude, the Enneagram's relationship to grace or how we look at the nine types and grace, and we're going to take a look at grace and recovery, how recovery and the 12 promises of recovery are related to grace. 
our need for practice, 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 and the benefits of grace. And we'll do some meditation and have some music uh, interspersed in all of this. So let's begin with what is grace? Traditionally, grace has really been thought of as kind of a religious concept. You know, unless we're talking about the graceful movement that a deer might make through, through the forest. But grace has generally been thought of as something that even though we're not entitled to, it exists. And I kind of had a problem with the part of it that, stop, that talks about us not being entitled to to grace and and so rather than looking at grace as a religious or not religious concept I really kind of played with this notion and have been playing with this notion for many years about whether or not we're in, entitled to grace if grace is just a field of energy that exists and God or our supreme being or our higher power or the divine matrix or just the energy of all that is is and it doesn't get created and it doesn't get destroyed it just exists then if that field of grace exists within all of that how would one be entitled or not entitled to that it would seem to be our obstacles to experiencing it are what prevent us from being with and in the field of grace if it's always here so I just want to offer that as what my understanding of grace is. Because it's a state of awakening, it really requires our attention. It really requires our awareness. So when you are in a state of grace, your mind becomes liberated from looping through a lot of emotions that kind of get in the way, a lot of thoughts that get in the way. You actually are in the existence. You're in the being of, of that experience. It's interesting because it's really the antidote to feeling poorly or feeling unhappy because I've never heard of anyone experiencing a state of grace that was unhappy or felt poorly. In a state of grace, you're aligned with the purpose for why you're here because you are in the state of your being. You're part of a field of possibilities, both for yourself and for everybody around you. And because grace helps those of us thrive and survive just innately, the notion of having a set of needs or feeling like our needs are not getting met just dissipates because we're in the state where everything is delivered to us. We don't have the awareness of, of a need. So this notion that human beings have to thrive and survive, which is kind of this innate biological drive as human beings, kind of pales in the background and we're actually just swimming in a state of grace. These things sound really simple, but I don't know about all of you, staying in a state of grace is really hard for me. And I imagine it's hard for others as well. So just briefly to jump ahead to how it's related to the Enneagram, and we're going to get involved in that way, way further. Consciousness, when it becomes personality, according to the Enneagram, these types that we have are a reflection, as we look at them in terms of personality, are a reflection of the contraction of type, of the contraction of what happens when we realize that we can't live in the divine essence or the qualities that we basically were, were given when we became a human being. And that contraction of type or the way personality is formed, and we're going to go into a lot more about this as time goes on, that contraction that describes this strategy or this personality that we've used to manage our lives 
is essential for us to move forward as human beings, and yet it needs to loosen for us to experience grace. So we're going to play back and forth between what the essential qualities of type are and as we look at the Enneagram types a little bit later on. So I want to share with you just a little bit about my experience of grace and so that, you know, you might have some experiences of grace that are similar or different, but let's just open the field of possibility. It is a field of energy that feels like nothing else. It can come out of the hardest times that we have. It can come when we least expect it. And sometimes it comes up during meditation. And sometimes we can summon it. And at other times we can't. I have struggled with the religious concept and yet made peace with it as I've embraced spirituality in addition to my religious heritage because when we allow spirituality to be a part of our experience of something greater than who we are without the rules that religion often has associated with it, we open ourselves to a greater field of possibility and we also come to understand a place that is inclusive instead of exclusive. So in spiritual traditions, oftentimes there are no guidelines or rules for how we get to heaven or what is considered appropriate behavior. Spirituality opens the doorway to the possibility of everybody having the same opportunities, regardless of where they live, how old they are, where they came from. That doesn't mean that having religious traditions, religious heritage, religious practices can't be an important part of spirituality. But spirituality offers us a larger container to hold all of that and a place for inclusivity versus exclusivity. And grace requires inclusivity. There is nothing exclusive about grace. Nobody gets left out. It's interesting because um, as somebody who's been working in the field of addictions for 41 years this year, that's a long time, <laughs> um, one of the elements of long-term recovery that seems to be apparent in most people who are happy in their recovery is that they've been able to access grace. They may have done it through mindfulness practices, they may have done it through meditation, they may have done it through their 12-step work, work with their sponsor, finding a community of people that have supported them, but they've all been able to access this field that we're talking about. They don't stay there any longer than any of the rest of us, but they get there. They know what it feels like. And it encourages that one day at a time I can do this for the next 24 hours, my life is getting better. Because the attachment is relinquished not only to the addiction, but the attachment is relinquished to many expectations through step work. Sometimes after a great exercise, especially Zumba, I feel like I'm in a state of grace. I don't know what that's all about. That might be a reflection of type. You may have had experiences where you move around and, you know, maybe it's just the endorphins going. Maybe it's the dance and the sensuality of Zumba. Who knows? But exercise oftentimes, uh, being in nature for me and for I know many others, can, can feel like you're swimming in a state of grace. Attempting to hold on to grace doesn't work, hasn't worked for me. And sometimes it emerges when I'm with animals or a lot of innocence or children. Watching children just be children, even in their chaos and craziness, and permits that, that field of grace to, to emerge for me. And grace can emerge from turbulent storms. Have you ever been outside watching a thunderstorm? and experienced grace, that's chaotic. So 
Grace doesn't necessarily show up just in peaceful times. It's kind of a really interesting thing when you begin to think about how and where grace shows up. So I'd like you to just take your attention and place it inside for just a moment and just think about how and when grace has shown up in your life. Let's talk a little bit about grace and gratitude. You know, grace can be defined as this undeserved gift, that which is given not because of any attribute of the receiver, rather out of the pure joy of the giver, that is, if grace is given. It's an invitation into a, a deeper relationship with the giver. But gratitude is the response. Gratitude is how we engage with grace. It's where we enter into the joy with the giver, receiving the unmerited gift or a merited gift with the same joy in which it was given. And gratitude is the choice to accept that gift because there are many times that we look at people and perhaps ourselves and don't access gratitude for what is. So gratitude is our response. Both grace and gratitude are expressions of love, the most powerful force in our universe. Grace the initiation and gratitude the response. Together they knit the giver and the receiver together in love because of the shared joy. So gratitude is about being thankful. It's an emotion of connectedness. It reminds us that we're part of a larger thing. And so we begin to see the relationship between grace and gratitude. The habit of gratitude can also help in the, res the response to letting go of, of things that kind of interfere with our, our happiness. It help with, can help with inner peace, mindfulness, and we also know that it's a part of that field that allows us to attract things into our lives. Because when we are swimming in grace and gratitude, when those things are happening, we are inviting a field of energy into our life that just allows things to move with us without our attachment to having a judgment or a response or a need for power and control a need for safety, security, and certainty, or a need for esteem and affirmation, which is all part of our Enneagram work. And again, now we look at how that, the knitting of grace and gratitude, allows the contraction of type or the centers to relax. Again, I'm going to say that. We have three centers here in we have our body center, our heart center and our head center. In our body center, we feel a strong need. These types feel a very strong need to strategically manage life through a sense of power and control. Through our heart center, our twos, threes, and fours have developed a strategy of managing life through a need for esteem and affirmation. And through our head center, the strategy for managing life is ruled through a need for safety, security, and certainty. When we are in gratitude and grace, and that is flowing, these needs 
which are contraction of type and feel as though we cannot thrive or strive without them, begin to relax. And they open the field for us to experience. As we, as we relax those contractions, the field of possibility or of grace and gratitude open. Contraction is released. Wouldn't it be neat if we could like just have a pill or something we could do to just make that happen? <laughs> okay, I need grace and gratitude right now. Give it to me. My mindfulness practice, I put on this meditation, and now we have the field of grace and, and gratitude opened up, and I am ready to rock and roll. Uh, doesn't quite work that way. There's a whole lot of mystery in terms of how all of this helps us function as, as human beings. So gratitude we know, especially you know, coming from a therapeutic background, coaching background, gratitude helps in terms of times of stress. It helps us return our attention to what's good in our life. It helps us develop appreciation. Um, it helps us to move from a negative space to a positive space. It helps us to engage with other people because people who don't have the ability to access gratitude are, are oftentimes really hard to be around. You know, for those of us who are sensitive to energy or really working on boundary issues, it makes it even more challenging sometimes to be around. And clearly, when one is in the process of addiction, gratitude is not happening. <laughs> So just going to go through, um, and many of you, this may be just a refresher, but just go through a, a uh, series of things that you can use to develop an attitude of gratitude. Starting a daily gratitude journal of things you're grateful for or thankful for. They could be items that you're grateful for. They could be experiences that you're grateful for. They could be life changes or emotions or people, anything that you wish. When it becomes really up-leveled, we really see that some of the more challenging things in our life we're grateful for too. Sometimes in the middle of them it's difficult and we do that in retrospect and we see in hindsight that, oh my goodness, if this hadn't happened and I hadn't lost my job, I might not have met this new group of wonderful people and engaged with them. If I moved to this new city, hadn't moved to this new city, I might not have had a new community. You know, If my church closed and I had to go to a new church, I might engage with people I may, may have never met before. If I have a disease that has shown up, I might not have learned to slow down and appreciate things in life, prioritize things differently. If I didn't have my addictions in my recovery community, I would have never met people. I would have continued to feel marginalized. I would have lived in shame and embarrassment and, humili and humiliation. And I might not have even made it at all. So at the end of every day, um, you know, I, I work with a lot of people at the end of every day or the beginning of every day, depending on how your biorhythms work, your circadian rhythms work. You know, beginning the day with gratitude and ending the day with gratitude or doing that at the beginning or the end of the day is really helpful. Gratitude affirmations. I got a, a beautiful, lovely gift from a very dear friend, which is a gratitude bottle. And I put uh, things in it every day that help remind me of things I'm grateful for. And it's interesting on even challenging day to add something I'm grateful for that's a challenge has really opened up my appreciation of gratitude in a far deeper way than it was before. Gratitude mindfulness. Stopping when you pause. Wouldn't it be neat if you could just put a little, a little reminder on your cell phone? I'm going to stop and be grateful for something in the next 10 minutes instead of checking my emails. I'm going to stop and place myself in a in a, a state of appreciation um, when my cell phone beeps. <laughs> what an interesting possibility. Even your bills, even the ability to be thankful for the fact that you have the money to take care of your bills, that somebody cares enough to send you a bill, that we live in a country where 
We have electricity and plumbing in our homes. You know, we forget that these are things that, that really invite gratitude in, which invites the state of grace. So the act of being grateful, the act of being grateful invites a state of grace. So we're going to do a gratitude meditation. And I'd like you to sit back. And take the focus of your attention to your breathing. And bring yourself in. And see if you can bring your own awareness to things in your life that you're thankful for right now. See if gratitude can just rise naturally up in you. And as it does, allow yourself to just sink into the feeling, surrender, let go to gratitude. In this letting go, see how it feels in your body. Notice your energy around it. And if it doesn't come up, that's okay. Just see if you can find a place to move into your heart. Sometimes touching your heart Maybe you need to flash through your life, all aspects of your life that you might be grateful for. And as you inhale and exhale, realize that each of these inhales and exhales gives you the breath of life. Focusing your awareness on your heart beating, pulsing, filling your heart with love and compassion and peace. And then allowing that love, compassion, and peace to flow back out with the exhale. What about your tears and your sorrows and the strength that you seem to be able to muster to make it through each day? Find some gratitude for that. Bring your awareness to your abundance, your expansion, your evolution. the shifts in your perspection.
the affluence in your life and prosperity and abundance and your ability to see growth and potential in every moment. Now just breathe and feel more grace and ease. Experiencing the warmth and love and compassion that sit in your heart. Allow your awareness now to shift into the nurturing relationships in your life, the new ones and the older ones. Notice the material things that came to you unexpectedly and those that came with great effort, commitment, and hard work. Think of the love in your life and your connection to the things that are sweet and loving and honorable and those that just feel right. As we raise our awareness to these and many more aspects of our life, we no longer take life for granted. We become aware and grateful for everything that we have. Just breathe and allow this to flow. And when you're ready, bring your attention back to the room and take a few minutes to just jot down things that you're grateful for, maybe some things that you haven't considered before as a gentle reminder. And if anybody needs something to write with, let us know.
And for those of you who are live streaming, you'll have about three minutes before we come back. You cut it? You want me to? Please. So before we move into our Enneagram information and how this is all related, I just would like you to sit and listen.
phase of our development, we will be amazed before we are halfway through. Number two, we are going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. Number three, we will not regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. Number four, we will comprehend the word serenity and we will know peace. Number five, no matter how far down the scale we have gone, we will see how our experience can benefit others. Number six, that feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. Number seven, we will lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in our fellows. <coughs> Number eight, self-seeking will slip away. Number nine, our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Number 10, fear of people and of economic insecurity will leave us. Number 11, we will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle us. And lastly, number 12, we will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. And I challenge you to think about grace in the same way. We will suddenly realize that grace is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. I must admit it's sometimes hard for me <coughs> um, when I'm working with people who have shut out the possibility of seeing themselves as part of something bigger than they are. And many use this excuse because it comes from a place of religiosity, when in fact, seeing yourself as part of this elegant universe and this field of grace has as much or as little to do with religiosity as you'd like it to. But we all, as human beings, have this, these needs for belonging and a need for safety, security, and certainty, and power and control. And just understanding those needs as we move into our Enneagram work that are absolutely plumbed into the human experience don't leave room for us not to be part of something bigger than who we are. So to do Enneagram work or to be interested in this Enneagram study or grace or any of this, it requires not necessarily an affiliation with a religion, but certainly an affiliation with seeing ourselves as part of something larger than who we are, whatever that is for you. So with that said, we're going to move into our, our Enneagram work related to grace. And you have a handout. Um, the only 
handout in here and we're going to go through what this is because just looking at this there's a lot of information on here. So we're going to start with the center of this diagram and we're going to move out from the center and we'll come back and look at each aspect as we go through the types. But I want you to be able to use this diagram and understand it. And this is a culmination of work that was done by a gentleman um, named Jerry Wagner from Loyola University, one of the original founders of the International Enneagram Association, a PhD psychologist, and someone who took the Enneagram and really brought it in a strong way into the field of psychology. And it's also been adapted to reflect more than the psychological aspects of personality because you'll see that we have incorporated this little funky diagram in the center of it. And this little funky diagram, this three-part diagram in the center, these three triads kind of swirling together, is meant to illustrate just consciousness itself. Now obviously we don't know what consciousness looks like, right? But this is just the illustration that we're looking at for consciousness itself. And consciousness itself, before it incarnates into a human being, before it actually becomes part of a human being in utero and, and after birth, is filled with essence. You could call it divine essence, you could call it essence, you could call it you know, part of this matrix that we're talking about. I just want to create an inclusive will ultimately, when birthed, need more than the divine essential qualities in order to function on planet Earth. We don't get fed without a caregiver when we're little. We don't make money to pay our bills without strategies to manage life. There's a series of things that absolutely have to happen when consciousness becomes personality in order for us to thrive and survive in the world. And at the same time that that's true, and we look at the various aspects of the Enneagram here, so we're going to um, start actually with peace, the top one, and move around from there. So the essential qualities, which are right outside of consciousness, as you start with type nine, these divine or innate essential qualities for each of the Enneagram types are the things that sit right out of that, outside of that circle of consciousness. For a nine, it's peace. For a one, it's goodness. For a two, it's love. For a three, it's efficacy. For a four, it's originality. For a five, it's wisdom. For a six, it's fidelity. For a seven, it's joy. And for an eight, it's power. And before we go further in the diagram, I want to talk a little bit about why we, we're going to start this conversation uh, in a different way than I've, uh, than I've ever taught Enneagram trainings before. You can start. I start all of my Enneagram conversations with the eight, and, and it's because it's the body center and it's the first part of this, uh, the body that develops in utero is the spinal cord and the reptilian brain. And for those of you who've been to my trainings before, you've probably heard this a lot. But, or you can start, you know, in terms of, of uh, con consecutive numbers and start with a one and go around. But we're going to start with a nine. And in many spiritual traditions, um, this would be uh, a clear understanding because we're going to talk about the point at which, so in Enneagram, Enneagram has all come through a lot of spiritual tradition, ancient spiritual traditions. This nine place is where, if you look at peace, is where the divine or where spirit or with where essence 
comes from essential consciousness and begins to divide itself into various aspects. So each one of the Enneagram types gets a gift. You know, our type, I mean, I remember when I first started studying the Enneagram, it was like, oh my God, all the things about my type that I have to change, they're so awful. I don't really like this. But we're going to start talking about the place of essence, where we came into being with this type and all it was was pure and good. And so as it emanates from the type 9 and becomes other aspects in here, because this is the point at which, so if you can take this consciousness little circle here and kind of place it above, this is the point at which through Enneagram spiritual tradition it talks about the division of or separation of those essential qualities or gifts to become type. And each one of those types got a gift. And each one of us has all of those gifts, but has a preference or a leaning or a default mechanism to use one of them a little bit more easily than the other. So for the purposes of our discussion today, we're going to talk about the Enneagram beginning with type 9 the point at which consciousness began to separate itself into various aspects coming through from type 9. So um, type 9 is, is called holy love and um, we're going to go back and forth. Be, actually, let's, let's go a little bit more into this diagram so you know better how to use it. So if we move from those essential qualities, which are now... Um, identified by type, you'll see a dotted, a really dark dotted line all the way around. And that dark dotted line is meant to illustrate the contraction or the coming in and ego development in order to thrive and strive as a human being. In other words, without having a strategy to manage life, living in peace and power and love and joy and goodness and efficacy and all those things are absolutely beautiful and wonderful and we spend most of our lives now trying to get back to them, but that contraction occurs in order to manage life. This is the strategy that's employed and how we get personality, why personality happens, why we, why we, need, why we need a personality. So if we now look outside of that contraction, and we look at um, the er area that's called B, we're leaving an area of genuine, ideal, authentic value or an essential quality. We're going to refer to it as an essential quality too. To the area of avoidance. So if I am peace as a nine, I avoid conflict. If I am goodness as a one, I avoid error. If I am love and need to shower others with that, I avoid my own needs. If I am efficacy, I avoid failure. If I am originality, I avoid being ordinary. If I am wisdom, I avoid intrusion. If I am fidelity, I avoid uncertainty. If I'm joy, I avoid pain. And if I'm power, I avoid weakness. And we really begin to get an understanding here, any from Enneagram, the, the lens of the Enneagram, for how when we lose sight of these essential qualities, and develop a strategy for managing life, how that which we are and we have lost sight of is that which we are trying to get back to. Because <laughs> we were given this amazing gift and in order to function in our world, it's difficult to hold onto it or to be part of it or to just be in swimming in the grace of it. 
C is the defense mechanism that each type uses. And for those of you who are not uh, from the field of psychology or don't understand defense mechanisms, defense mechanisms get a bad rap. You know, defense mechanisms are not necessarily just to, you know, have you shutting things out of your life. Defense mechanisms are also part of that strategy that we have learned to use and employ to manage life. If we were totally struck by the full force of everything that happened to us, losing a job, you know, a divorce, somebody dying, if we were hit by the full force of the emotionality of all of that without a defensive strategy to manage some of the difficulties in our life, we wouldn't be here to talk about it. So defense mechanisms, the purpose of them is to help mitigate or help us cope with and manage those things that happen. So this defensive strategy, although it helps us do that, it is also another obstacle to grace. So I hope that you're getting a picture of how, how this works. I mean, it's, this is like, we want grace. Grace is available to us. It's a field of possibility and energy that's always there. And yet, to be in it all the time and, and not aware of other things that are going on, we're not making it. When I was creating um, my business, which is called Enneagram Connections and is being launched slowly, um, one of the things that I was asked to do is to come up with a tagline. And I offer this to you because I feel like it really speaks to the journey of uh, those of us who are Enneagram aficionados and who grow, want to grow our self-awareness and who want to understand grace. Um, are in and it's the tagline is called dancing between observation and participation it's like we really need to find that way of dancing between observation and participation between a way of looking at ourselves standing back cultivating that inner observer and at the same time engaging with life Know when it's time to, to listen and know when it's time to speak. Know when it's time to watch. Know when it's time to take action. It is this flow, which is grace in and of itself. It's another explanation of grace. It's that flow of the ability to dance between observation and participation. We'll now move out. Oh, well, let's go through the... Um, the, the uh, defense mechanisms of each type um, and we're not going to go into the specifics of them today and what they they mean uh, you can you can google them you can talk to me after this uh, today if you want to know more about that um, but a nine narcotizes or goes numb a one has reaction formation I'm sorry yes one is reaction formation a two represses their own needs. A three removes themselves from identification. A four moves into introjection. A five into isolation. A six into projection. A seven into rationalization. And an eight into denial. Those are the defense mechanisms that each type employs to manage their lives. And each one of us has an idealized, which is the outer circle, or D, an idealized self. In order to feel settled. A one, I do this in order to feel right. A two, I do this because I want to be helpful. A three does it in order to feel successful. A four does it in order to feel special. A 
a five in order to see themselves as perceptive, a six as loyal, a seven to feel okay, and an eight to feel powerful. Now there's one other layer, and I'm going to go through them with you and have you write them down if you'd like, which are the essential qualities. And the essential qualities are going to be discussed in a little bit according to David Daniels, and uh, I like his perception because he integrates a psycho-spiritual approach to, to this and not just um, uh, a spiritual or religious one. <coughs> There's a little bit of psychology in the essential. And a vice. A fixation is a contracting thought which is mitigated by a holy idea. So we're going to talk about the holy idea. So the fixation moves into a holy idea. And the vice, which is an emotional contraction, the gift of that, or the high side of that, if we want to look at a high side of that, is called a virtue. And so rather than looking at vices and virtues or fixations and holy ideas from a religiosity perspective, we're going to look at them as essential qualities. So for each one of these types, as we move around the Enneagram, I'm going to give you two names. One is um, going to be about the release of the thought and the other is the release of the emotion or the higher essential qualities of each type. We're going to start with type 9. Is that clear? Okay. So we have a contraction not just with uh, trying for our essence, trying to emanate and, and have a strategy as a human being. We also have a contraction in each of these types that has us believing that Oh my God, I have to think a certain way and I have to feel a certain way. And what we're talking about now is in order to experience grace or that field of possibility, the field of energy, we're going to need to release that contraction and move into this higher aspect. And here they are. We're going to go through them in much greater detail, but I'm going to give them to you first. So for a nine, it's what's called holy love or right action. For a one, it's holy perfection or serenity. The twos get two of them, holy freedom and holy will, and then humility. The three is holy hope and law or veracity. Veracity meaning truth. The four, holy origin or equanimity. And for those of you who need to spell equanimity, it's E-Q-U-A-N-I-M-I-T-Y. For the five, it's holy omniscience or non-attachment. And omniscience is spelled O-M-N-I-S-C-I-E-N-C-E. -E. For, the, for the six, it's holy faith or courage. For the seven, it's holy... Six is holy faith or courage. For the seven, it's holy work or sobriety. That doesn't mean that just sevens have issues with sobriety. Let me be very clear with that. <laughs> and for the eights, it's holy truth or innocence. So 
before we walk into these essential qualities of type and talk about them further, I want to refer to our triads here. So within our body triad, within our eight, nine, and one triad, the strategy is all about finding a way to experience power and control in my life. And there are three flavors of doing that. There are actually more than three flavors, but because we're, we're, there are subtypes too, but we're just going to stick with the, some three basic flavors. So the three flavors of finding power and control in my life, and we all need power and control. This isn't something that just um, the body types need. We all need power and control, right? So if we all need power and control, the ways that are the highest level or the highest expressions of that for a nine, because we're going to start with nine first, are to take right action. And if a nine is not action is difficult, let alone right action. <laughs> because the nines are so busy trying to create peace and mediation that having a position at all, taking a stance, expressing a position, is not easy to do. If I want to avoid conflict, taking a stand about something and doing something about it is kind of counterintuitive, isn't it? So the actual highest expression is right action. For our eights, if I have a pushback against power and control and I have, I'm sorry, a pushback against vulnerability, the expression of my, my pushback against vulnerability is in reaction to experiencing mine and everybody else's innocence. If I have a pushback as a one and looking at what's wrong with the world, and I find myself in judgment and criticism about what needs to be corrected in this world. The idea of seeing holy perfection and serenity with everything being perfect just as it is, is not easy. So that's our body our body section. So before we move on to that, I really want to leave us with this body section. We're going to go take a look at these body essential qualities. So holy love or right action actually means the blissful state of unconditional love and union where everyone belongs equally and allows for the bodily experience of action that's appropriate to any given situation. It takes into account the self equal to, not more or less than anybody else. And because of this, we use the term right action. It entails our direct knowing that action supports life and the well-being of all, something that's forgotten. The inertia towards the self, or what we call the slothful energy of the nine, dissipates. And a need to actually do something takes over. And from this stance, empathy, care, and compassion radiates to everybody. There's the acceptance of self without judgment. And we take action appropriate and essential to each situation. As we move into a place of grace for that, can anybody think of a question that might be difficult for a, a nine to do? How, what would get in the way of grace? 
four and nine. And I'll repeat that for our people live streamed if anybody comes up with anything here. Our nines have right action to offer the world and yet feel compelled by doing nothing or compelled to avoid conflict. Unexpected change? Unexpected change would be an, an incredibly difficult thing for, for a, a nine. So the, the suggestion of unexpected change, you see how, and I think I love that you, you raised that because within the flavor of unexpected change, each one of us has a response. Each type has a response. But for the nine, that would create a real challenge because it's going to upset the, the equilibrium. There's an equilibrium, an, a state of equilibrium. Uh, it's actually a narcotized state. But it looks like a state of equilibrium. So it's really upsetting the narcotized state. You have to, if you are narcotizing, and you can talk about addictions. There's bunch of ways that you can narcotize as an addict. In other words, numb out. Narcotization just means a way of numbing out, you know. So um, when we look at uh, moving out of a place of numbing out and being with the world and what's really going on, the recognition of that compels the nine to move into a state of right action. And when nines move into a state of right action, I mean, they're some of the most phenomenal leaders. They have a great leadership style. They take a very strong stance. They sit in grace. They can, they can hold the um, space for people to have community and be inclusive without judgment and yet still move forward considering the best case scenario for everyone. So you can see how the nines offer grace to all of us or to really contribute to the field of grace um, from that place. Thank you. Any other thoughts about nines before we move on? Go along to get along. Going along to get along would be a, certainly a way that would be an obstacle for um, the expression of right action for sure. I mean I just would like things again where if my goal is to make sure that there are no waves and everybody is just kind of getting along with everybody else, I might, I might not take right action. I might know what the right thing to do is or I might just fall asleep to what the right thing to do is. Many times we talk about the sleepiness of, of the nine and, and not being in that awake state. Yes? Finding slash accepting a new job. Could you say a little bit more about well, that? It strikes me that somebody that's a nine, when they need to get a job, have a very difficult time, perhaps, in making that decision. Is it the right thing to do? Is it what should I do? I don't think, you know, just mm -hmm. the, the conflict of decision making. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so we talked about the conflict of decision making and finding the right job or even getting a job. And there are so many aspects of that in that are contributed in nineness. You know, one of them might be being easily distracted, one of them might be uh, not wanting to take a position or make a choice, you know, the inertia of not really wanting to, to, to do anything because there is, you know, when the contraction of type happens. So if we look at our inner circle here and we look at the contraction of type, you know, the nine is not moving. You know, there is no movement. There is some sedentary kind of uh, energy that's just not moving. Thank you. Okay. So our ones. Actually, let's go back to our eights. You know, and this is really confusing when we start with emanating through the nine because normally I go eight, nine, one, or we can start around the uh, with a one, but. It's, it's important to understand that this is the place. So if you can th think about just nines as the place from peace where everything is kind of coming through and separates into these essential qualities, it's kind of really helpful. So our eights, as little people who are quite innocent, something generally happens 
early in life and they develop an attitude or find out that life isn't fair. You know? Bad things happen. And only the strong survive. And in order to survive, I must be strong. And I must not be vulnerable. And again, you know, nobody really likes, I've never had a, had a room where I asked the question, how many of you like to be vulnerable, or really anybody raises their hand. Vulnerability isn't generally a place, unless you're at a Brene Brown lecture maybe, where everybody would raise, I want to be vulnerable. <laughs> we know that this is important. Um, and it is important. But we all have pushbacks. Each type has a pushback against vulnerability. But the eights are the poster child for the pushback against vulnerability because they really don't see any value in vulnerability because it, it, it relinquishes their ability to feel like they have a sense of empowerment, power and control in their own lives. And how would that affect the expression of grace? So I'll read this to you and then we'll, we'll talk as a group. So we're talking about holy truth and innocence here. It means knowing and embracing the essential truth residing in all beings in each moment, not just our own version of the truth. This quality termed innocence enables us to come freshly to each situation without prejudice, agendas, or power motives. The exuberant energy that fits each situation and person. So that lustful energy that we talk about as an aid, instead of seeing it as something negative, we can just see this as a level of the, a, a type of exuberant energy that moves forward. We also come back to appreciating the greater truth of the oneness of all at the four of being. Proportionately, the application of ample energy fitting a situation. In other words, the discernment of how much energy to bring into a situation. That's a real growth spot for an eighth to be able to sit back and say, this is how much energy I want to bring into a situation. This fits this situation. This doesn't fit this situation. I'm not coming in as Darth Vader in every situation I walk into. This stance allows for us, for our experiencing each person's truth and boundaries, which actually enhance our own power. So as I respect your ability to say no to me, it actually empowers me and you. We experience this innocence in little children who eagerly explore an entire spectrum of life freshly with curiosity and openness. And this is where, this is what the, the aid of lost sight of. You know, it's, you see a little child who walks into a situation, oh, you know, I want to play with you today. Oh, you don't want to play with me? Why not? You know? And somehow or another, that really, really fades. Now, most of us, again, that fades away as we, as we um, grow up. But in an eight, it's, there's a pushback. It's like, I don't want that in my life. So how can we come up with some examples maybe of how grace, there's an obstacle to grace from the stance of a type eight? Well, certainly there's, because of this lustful platform or this over-exuberant energy and the energy that almost comes forward before they walk into a room even, it's pretty intimidating. Yeah, so the, the statement was made because they always get their way. Well, yeah, that kind of doesn't leave a lot of room for innocence, does it? No. Or other people's opinions or inclusivity. Yeah, yeah. And interestingly enough, you know, if you were to talk to eights about what works well in their life or how change is made, it's having people who have the courage to stand up to them and saying, I don't agree with you. And so, you know, as we think about, I'm just talking as a therapist and a coach now, about having the guts, the chutzpah, the, the motivation to do that when somebody's that intimidating, that can be really tough, you know. Um, one of my one of my 
long-term goals is to bring the Enneagram full force into the addictions and treatment community. And when you start to think about particularly, this is a great example, um, but particularly type eights and how to do therapist or coach and client matching, you know, there's a lot of people helping professionals who are terrified of working with type eights. And how much service are we actually providing this type when we back away and back down from that? How do we have the experience or even offer the, them the experience of moving into a state of grace if we can't openly confront and stand directly in front of that person and say, that's BS, you know? Or you, you don't scare me. Or why would you want to scare me, intimidate me? Well, how's that working in your life? I'm, I'm not a Dr. Phil fan, but I do love that question. And yeah, how's that working in your life? You know, it's not, you know? Because the eights, just like every other type, want to be loved. They want to be connected. They don't want to be, you know, I mean, every once in a while there's a desire to intimidate people. But the idea of just walking around and, and, and intimidating people forever and not engaging in connections, meaningful connections in life, is not what the aid is up for. And it's certainly, when we start thinking about, you know, health and well-being and recovery, it certainly is not supported uh, by recovery. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pitching the addictions and treatment community and mental health community to really start thinking about ways that we invite this field of grace, we invite the process of recovery, we invite the opening for change by going in and directly addressing those issues that, w that, that people have lost sight of. And for an aid, it's innocence. It's the last thing in the world that you would think of when you are in, in the, encountering a type eight energy is that they've lost sight of innocence. <laughs> yes. of that kind of can go into denial from the standpoint of they want to be okay that they're that powerful and to sort of look at that in terms of their relationships might make them less than or might make them feel weak. Mm -hmm. maybe. Mm -hmm. So I'm going, for, because we're on live stream, I'm going to try and reframe and if I've lost any quality of what you're trying to say, stop me and I'll, I'll make sure to, to include that. So, you know, there's this, the dilemma that was brought up is what happens when, you know, an eight with this exuberant energy, the sense of power, who wants to engage with people and has uh, very little or a poor understanding of how much energy and intimidation they might be bringing to a situation um, what happens then when they want to have this desire to connect and also this desire to maintain that level of energy and power, you know, and there's so much denial around that. How does that all work? I, I, I'm hoping I'm yeah. capturing some of the quality of your question. Uh -huh. Well, the, the interesting thing is, and this is the dilemma particularly with this type, type 8s are the only type that have a real comfort, I guess is the best word I can say, a real comfort with anger, you know. I mean, we all get angry, and angry, anger serves a purpose, but eights have a, 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 very, um, a very strong level of comfort and confidence with anger, and you can feel it, you know, in them when they're around you. And for those of us who don't, have that, it's a real challenge. And so the, uh, the, 
the opportunity to, to grow in awareness and to stay awake to where I'm comfortable with anger and the role that it serves in my life and to also sense how comfortable perhaps an eight is with anger and the role it holds in their life and to walk into that deliberately is really, it, it can be a, a big challenge. So for all the types in, that I've in, encountered in, in working with thousands and thousands of clients over the last 41 years, um, and obviously this happened way before I knew the Enneagram, those types can be particularly challenging and yet without somebody having the ability to stand toe to toe and say, this isn't gonna work, how would they ever get help or change? So when we, I'll just throw a little caveat here about how addictions work got started, um, which is we look at uh, Synanon and all those things way back when, the whole recovery community thing in the 70s. It was basically defacing people and humiliating people and hitting them over the head and throwing them in a dark room and, and having them cold turkey. And I would imagine that the majority of people who were taking the approach to uh, recovery at that time were all eights. Not understanding that that might work for an eight. So, so I also don't want to throw away that whole concept of synonym because for an eight, <laughs> that might be very helpful. But for the rest of the types, probably isn't going to work. So, you know, we get, I'm using that as an example of how somebody might come in to address a social problem. You know, I would imagine there was a group of eights that came in and said, we've got a social problem, we've got an addiction, these people are bad, they're wrong, we're going to get them together, we're going to get it straightened out, and this is how we're going to do it. And that became the whole movement at that point in time. And guess what? It worked for a few people, probably other type eights but it didn't work for many, and we've seen the complexion of those kinds of things change. So again, let's not throw out the whole notion of the fact that that doesn't work, because sometimes that hard-nosed, direct, confrontational approach with somebody who's in denial, because that's their primary defense mechanism, is essential, but that doesn't mean we have to shame or hurt or harm people in the process. You know, you can have a, a kinder approach even to looking I think at that denial. Eight would also perhaps have a difficult time really and truly feeling vulnerable because they could see that as a weakness. And so therefore being in relationship with others could be challenging in that there it, it requires a compromise uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, compromises Mm -hmm. successful relationships, and relationships yes. and all of that and yes. they may have a hard yes. time with that. Yes. So they're defensive about yes. being weak. Yes. So the defensive posture of an, an eight and the pushback against vulnerability does make relationships challenging. And we all have specific challenges in our relationships but you're now defining the relationship. Now let's just take that and, 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 and kind of expand that concept if we can for a minute. Because the relationship with others is going to be challenging if we don't, if we have a pushback against vulnerability. But the relationship to grace is also challenging because it requires vulnerability. The relationship to self is challenging. These same things that we're talking about are going to be the same challenges to experiencing ourself as swimming in this, in this field of being okay of swimming in this field of possibility, of being open to the, the laws of manifestation, the laws of just, of just being, the laws of just, you know, of, of experiencing God's grace, of, of divine grace, of the divine matrix, of, of whatever, because there's going to be a pushback. Yes? I think what would help is, um I think Mother Teresa was an eight, right? Well, there's a lot of but debate of whether or not she was Trump, an eight or a that two. A, that's an eight. So you've got healthy eights and you've got dysfunctional eights. Yes. That, that, so yeah. and every type that has you know more people that done more work on themselves and done inner work yes. are going to be 
they're going to they're going to um, meld into other types. Yes, you know? yes. So I, I I love what you raised because we have levels of development of our type. Just because I am a type and I identify with a type does not mean that I have less or healthier qualities. The amount of work that I've done on myself, the amount of self-awareness that I have, the ability to, to, to continue to self-observe, the ability to take in information, incorporate information, access grace, is always going to impact what we look like as a particular type. And there are lots of um, great Enneagram trainings uh, on levels of development of type and seeing where you're at in type. It's actually a great way of strategically looking at bringing um, the Enneagram into treatment programs too because there are levels that you can actually use to treatment plan that I teach in, in other sessions too. Um, but yes, and, and that intimidating quality. So the, the underlying drive or the underlying contraction against vulnerability is something that does not go away. It's what we do with it when we're aware of it. So if I am a healthy eight and I am aware of the fact that I have this over exuberant energy and I can intimidate people, my understanding of that and the ability to back off away from that or to read other people's facial expressions and engage with people in a different way is going to look very different than if I either am not conscious of it or if I deliberately want to use that tactic of intimidation to get my needs met or to get something accomplished, you know? And who's to judge whether or not that's always bad or good, you know? Yes? One other help would be to kind of uh, say what kind of people will, occupational wise are eights or ones or twos or fives. So okay. So we could go into that. Does that help a lot? So I'll go back because we've only started with the nine and then I want to move on. I don't want to get stuck in type eight. But um, the suggestion was made that sometimes it's helpful to, to talk about how these show up in different occupations and, um, and where there can be an expression of one's trade in terms of doing the work that um, where the essential qualities uh, are really get expressed. So let's start with a nine because we started with a we started with a nine. So peacemakers, ambassadors, people who are great leaders and need to be inclusive in in their um, in their uh, process of involving people. Um, uh, I don't want to use examples of people because I really don't like to do that because I think there are people who disagree with that a lot. Um, but I will give occupations in general. Um, teachers, nines can be great teachers. Uh, nurses, um, the ability to see all points of view. These are the kinds of things that are just essential, innate gifts and qualities of a nine. Um, Trying to create, can you imagine if we had a really healthy nine leader who could take right action, but really uh, take into consideration m many aspects of what we need a a a in our country, in our cities, in our towns, in the world, what people need, you know? Um, nines also have a really uh, um, grand ability to um, just create a space, an open, safe space for people to share that information, you know, invite people to come forward and, and provide that information. Eights, we sometimes need leaders that just take a strong position, generals in our armies, not the, not the uh, lieutenants and not the captains and not the privates, but the generals in the army, the leaders, they make, you know, a, a really evolved eight who has taken into consideration many different things can can take people out of a, a difficult situation. You may have a lot of particular feelings about some of the people that I'm going to um, bring up, but you know, there was a time when New York City really, really needed a tremendous amount of help, and regardless of how you feel about Mayor Giuliani, I mean, he really did a tremendous job with, with moving uh, people around and creating some, some safety in New York City. Um, you know, some people say Mother Teresa was a very evolved eight. She also has been talked about as a two. So I sometimes I really don't like to use uh, particular people, but um, t 
taking a position and being a leader, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was in, in Enneagram 8 and, and took our country at a very, very, very difficult time. We don't generally have Enneagram 8s as leaders in our country, although I believe we probably do right now. Um, uh, because, um, you know, that it's, we, we, we don't like generally um, uh, the notion of, of being led by uh, our government hasn't generally chosen that. Let me just leave it at that. I don't want to get into any political anything right now. Um, so, yeah, the, taking a stance and leadership are the qualities of an eight. We get to our ones, in our ones, I mean, the whole world needs to be corrected. There's a lot of things that need attention. It's really easy to find things that need attention and that need to be made better. Our type ones have lost sight of the fact that there is perfection in the world as it is. It may not look perfect, but there is holy imperfection. There's holiness imperfection that is imperfection. We're constantly striving. The world is constantly, the universe is constantly unfolding and making itself and evolving itself. There is a divine orchestration or a, an energy moving all of that that's not directed by me and it's not directed by you. And our type ones have lost sight of the fact that that's actually going on already. So there is a holy perfection and serenity in things as they exist. It means the undivided oneness at the core of our being without judgment, which we experience in the body as a calm and abiding, simple appreciation of differences. And sitting within that, we see serenity. Then all experiences, including the vital instincts, occur without resistance, just like little kids. All positive and negative feelings occur without resistance and anger dissipates. This means we're in the natural flow of positive and negative experience which gives us a non-judgmental perspective. We are in the place where the yin and yang and, and positive and negative are constantly going on. In this stance of being, it becomes impossible to intentionally hurt another being as love is all there is. So the criticism abates in the acceptance of both the positive and the negative. And in that criticism pulling back and, and the lack of noticing what's wrong or what needs to be improved, it allows all possibility. Um, type 1s, uh, well, first of all, let's, let's open this up. Any questions about how anger shows up in these? Because we talked about this is an expression of anger that's right out there and very strong. This, is, this entire body triad has a particular relationship to anger. So nines, if they uh, avoid conflict, mm, anger is kind of, you know, we, we call it the passive-aggressive stance with anger um, because... It's like, I don't have any anger, I don't have any anger until you push me into a corner and then I won't, you know, I, I get very, very stubborn. So you see a passive aggressive stance. This is an anger in your face. And if we're looking at perfection, how do you think ones handle anger? Is anger okay? No. They certainly can get pretty angry because that's their, that's their preferred uh, way of, of, of dealing with fear is, is by accessing anger, but they repress it. Yes? So they're, they're very defensive, and it's everybody else's fault. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that happens, uh, thank you for that, one of the things that happens with ones oftentimes is it has to be somebody's fault. Now again, every type can move into somebody blaming somebody. It's not that ones have the have the, you know, the uh, line on blame. We all blame, but there's got to be a person or somebody responsible because if somebody, if it needs to be fixed and we want it to be fixed and we want the world to be a better place, the easiest way for us to deal with that, to come to an understanding of that, is to make it somebody else's fault or make it somebody's fault. Yes? I'm new to this, but would it be like... Um 
like righteous indignation? Like Absolutely. Okay. Yes, righteous indignation like, is one of the things that we it's talk okay about. To get angry because I'm doing this for the good of humanity. Right, right, right. Yeah, righteous indignation is one of the very strong ways of dem of talking about a, uh, a type one that has some work to do. Yes, yes, and that doesn't mean that even if you were doing work on yourself, that wouldn't show up. That you wouldn't hit, have the experience of these energies. So this is a great time to kind of bring grace back into the conversation because. Even if we have this notion of righteous indignation, stubbornness, um, um, or intimidation, those things aren't going to go away. Remember, this is the strategy for managing life that we've chosen to employ. It's the awareness around that and the, the constant investigation and that dance between observation and participation that really creates the pause or the grace to show up or the change to happen. But yes, righteous indignation is thank you for bringing that up. And so ones have this innate critical nature. Now you can find some ways to cope with that. You can find levity and to stand back from that as you self-observe that because it doesn't mean that because it's showing up it needs to be out there, just like the examples we used. But the, uh, one of the challenges that happens with our type ones is that if we, and we all, have a, we all have an inner critic. There are nine inner critics here. Ones are not the only one with an inner critic. They have a very loud inner critic, but they happen to have a committee of inner critics. So if you think that you're being hard on a one. A one is being doubly hard on themselves. So whatever criticism you, you see is only uh, the tip of the iceberg about what's going on. They have a whole committee of inner critics. So you can imagine how difficult grace is to let in. If you've got all these, all these chairmen and committee members shouting out and trying to find things that are not right that need to be corrected finding a way to quiet them down through levity through self-observation through mindfulness practices you know that's that's the challenge for our ones that's the big challenge for grace to show up for our type ones yeah but if you're in a plane and something goes wrong or if you get a code blue and you've got a search work on you want to type one. So well, let's talk a little bit about occupations for type ones. So there are some really cool occupations for that I'd want a type one in my life for. If I was having surgery, I want a perfectionist doing surgery on me. I want somebody who's paying attention to every little detail and you know it's nice to have bedside manner but the perfection is really welcome when somebody's going to be cutting me open and taking a look at some of the things that need to be uh, taken care of. So, so surgeons, um, things, uh, audits where we have people auditing things. IRS agents are, are uh, auditors are often type ones and they do their job well. It doesn't mean that, you know, that that would be something that we would all like to do, but paying attention to that detail and what needs to be corrected. Um, a lot of airline pilots are ones, you know, paying attention to all the details and the specifics. Don't you think they want to go home safely to their families too? You know? So they, 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 we might see them as, as type sixes as well, but and there's a lot of, um, a lot of uh, ones who, who are, are pilots. This notion of paying attention to morality and what is correct and what needs to, to be corrected in the world. Sometimes we find a lot of priests and ministers and people who um, uh, have a lot of morality issues um, as type ones. Again, that does not necessarily mean they are not without grace or can't invite grace. Everyone is entitled to access the field of grace. So if any judgment is coming through uh, from me and, and, and you, that is certainly not my intention in any of this. 
So we alluded to something that we haven't gotten into and really won't spend a lot of time with for our body types, but I do want to make just kind of a generalized mention. Each of the triads, our body triads, our heart triads, and our head triads, have a particular relationship with a particular emotion. And for our body types, it's anger. They're looking for power and control. And, and I have never heard this from another Enneagram teacher, but this is the sense that I've made of it, this for myself. And maybe a, a, somebody else teaches this as well. If there are only two emotions on the planet, love and fear, and there are, all the rest of them are variations of that, and I kind of live with that supposition, when we look at um, anger and fear and distress as being the three uh, um, compromising emotions here, they're all a variety of fear. So when I feel like I'm out of control and have no power in my life, and I'm an eight, nine, or a one, I have an expression of fear by dealing with not the fear, but anger as a response to the fear. And when we get to our twos, threes, and fours now, this notion of panic and distress is how twos, threes, and fours deal with their fear. So everybody has fear. Fear is essential for us to survive and thrive, but how we express that within our triads is going to look a little bit different. So we're now going to move to our twos, threes, and fours. And we're going to take um, our twos first. And our twos have a pushback against um, looking at themselves. And they tend to wake up and, and see the world through other people. And their um, their uh, Essential quality is holy freedom, holy will, and humility. And it means that real needs get met by a greater will than our own, which will create freedom to be in the natural flow of giving and receiving without pride, which is really the definition of humility. You know, so many people think humility is this self-deprecating kind of experience. Humility is an actual real way of looking at how um, giving and receiving flows. It's not self-deprecating. It's having a realistic expectation or the art of being teachable in that process. So this flow, we see this flow in the way that an infant and a mother interact with each other. It's just pure love. Um, what's, uh, we sense what's appropriate in terms of this give and take this flow, all of which uh, provides a, a congruence. We're free to operate without the attachment to the needs of ourself or others because we're just existing in this flow. Thus, true humility is simply being in, that, in the natural flow of giving and receiving. And so the two's energy has gone to taking care of the needs of other people. And when my energy, if I'm a two, is going into the needs of taking care of other people, whose needs are getting denied? Mine. So if I focus on your needs, and your needs, and your needs, and your needs, my needs are not being addressed. Ultimately, if I don't address my own needs, I'm going to be a pretty resentful human being because I have needs too. And so this repression, when we talked about the defense mechanism of repression, is repressing my own concerns so that I can express love and, 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 and you know, helping you with your needs. So that the two's place of grace or opening to grace is to just being in the field, allowing the experiences of the field of the natural flow of giving and receiving. And oftentimes you'll see twos have a, this, this strong desire to figure out what they can do for help give other people. So I identify with uh, the type two and um, I'm like on automatic tilt when I am walk into a situation. I, if I was to walk into this event, it'd be, how can I help you? What do you need? What can I do? And it's not even 
in my awareness half the time that I might want to find my seat, I might want to find a comfortable place to be until I'm done and then I realize I don't even have anywhere to sit or to be or a drink or whatever and or I haven't gone to the bathroom. You know, it's like there's so the the need to focus on one's need without judging that as being needy and those needs not just being okay, but being part of the natural flow of giving and receiving. It's not that my needs now are more important than yours, but it's how and where do my needs fit in that natural flow of giving and receiving. And when I am in a graceful state, that just happens. It's like it feels so easy to be in that natural flow of giving and receiving. And that's what grace feels like for me and knowing my place of what I really can do and what I can't do and where I need to ask for help and where I actually can provide uh, or knowing where my limits are. Oftentimes I hear twos talk about the fact that they have absolutely no idea of how tired they are until they're so exhausted because they are just so out of touch with themselves. The other thing that I will share as a card carrying too that I think needs attention is a notion of appropriate boundaries. You know, you know, not just how tired I am, but when I need to say no and let other people have their own experiences. It's not my responsibility to give you your experiences. It's your responsibility to have your own experiences. And it's also my responsibility to understand that when uh, my advice or help is not wanted, I need to back off and just be okay with that because there's this kind of innate desire to move forward and, and do something. So um, any thoughts or questions about challenges, additional challenges to the experience of grace with a type 2? Uh, yeah, so like the 8, 9s, and 1s, they are comfortable with anger. And you were saying that the, the twos uh, are comfortable with anxiety? Distress and panic. What, yeah. So when fear shows up in a two, thank you for that. So for a two, three, and four, when fear shows up, it shows up as worry, panic, distress. They're not even aware. I mean, I, when I hear the word fear, I didn't even, I, I don't see myself or experience myself as somebody who's got a lot of fear. But you start using the word fear, um, uh, panic or distress or worry, especially about people I love. Oh my God, I can relate to that all over the place. And it's an expression of fear. You know, it's how fear shows up in my life. I'm worried more about you uh, and panicked more about, you know, something that could, could go wrong, I suppose, or... Um, have some distress when things uh, when anger shows up or fear shows up that's that's what it feels like for me sometimes people call this the shame triad too but that and and, and we can get into how shame shows up in terms of fear but I think distress and panic for the purposes of our discussion today are, are really uh, better terms yes and also fear of not being liked by others and being judged by yes others. yes so the fear of, so this is an, an image triad, so the idea, so this is, this is, this triad is seeking power and control. This triad is seeking belonging or, or a sense of affirmation and esteem. And these, this need for power and control, this need for affirmation and esteem, and this need for safety, security, and certainty are aspects we all need. But the driving force in our heart triad here, twos, threes, and fours, is a need for esteem and affirmation. And part of that is a need to be liked. You know, I want to be liked. So if I have a sense that you might not like me, if I tell you how I really feel, and my overriding need is to be liked, I'm not going to tell you how I really feel until I feel like it's very safe or I can swim in that opportunity of, you know, knowing that it's okay and and I'm, I'm sorry that makes me laugh because I, I I had she had me take a test to see what I was 
Um, and I said that I would be too after a series of questions, but um, waiting for a safe space for the flow with other, you know, interacting with somebody, if I feel like I'll be communicating or interacting with them and I'll think like, oh, I need to say this, but I'll just wait because I know the time will present itself down the road. I won't necessarily say it then. Mm -hmm. And then when it feels right, like, okay, our moods are good, everything is safe, like I can say this and the individual responds, you know, in a way that I would expect them to. Uh -huh. But there's other times too where I think like if I say this now to someone, what is their response going to be towards me and am I going to like it? Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to reframe that for our live streamers and again help me if I'm, I'm okay. if I'm missing something. So considering what you might say and how you might engage with someone or what, or what information you might offer is often determined by whether or not it's the right time in the conversation, whether or not they're going to receive it, what their reaction might be. And so your pacing, even if you have something come up, your pacing of providing that information is really kind of dictated by several other factors. Yeah, I don't want to upset that more. Yes, yeah. yeah. So without trying to up upset people, so if one of the things, and, and again, thank you, these are, I love hearing from people that raise issues because you bring up things that are very pertinent to situations that really are going to show up for that particular type. And if I'm reluctant to tell you how I really feel about something or I'm reluctant to offer you information if I'm a helping professional that I know is important but I'm not sharing it with you because it might either hurt your feelings or I may end up having a bad day as a result of that, how much help am I really providing? So it takes a lot of courage to develop a relationship with walking into uncomfortable conversations for a two, you know. And the, one of the things that is absolutely essential uh, in terms of growing your level of development as a two is doing that. I of, often say to myself, whatever's not going to kill me is going to make me stronger. And I know that, you know, that's just a, a phrase, but for me, <laughs> it's a reality. Yeah, yeah. Yes? Before you go to two, can you give some occupation? Twos make, they make good therapists, they make good mommies, they make uh, good nurturers, caregivers. Um, they, it's interesting, we've had a boatload of first ladies that are twos. Um, they happen oftentimes to be the power behind the throne. They don't like to take front and center, but they really love helping people who are in powerful positions. Um, I know when I had uh, uh, my agency, I never needed to have the front office. I always had an office that was kind of in the middle. It was really okay for somebody else to to have, I just didn't, I don't, I wanted to be seen, but I didn't really want to call attention to be seen. I don't know if that's a part of a, a two issue, but that's, you know. And yet I certainly did not, not want to be noticed. I wanted to be noticed, but I just didn't want to like put myself out there to be noticed. <laughs> um, so our threes, our type threes um, are, are, Essential qualities are holy hope, law, and veracity. And they are what we call our, our human doings instead of human beings. Because one of the things that happens with type threes is that they really believe that everything that they do is about who they are versus who they are is about who they are. Um, and so they happen to be very efficient and productive and forget that just by being they are entitled to grace or can swim in grace. It means that things get done according to universal laws and not because they did them. This provides enduring hope for the future which in turn allows for the expression of our own true feelings termed veracity. So if I am not trying to accomplish something and I am just part of the process knowing that that process is going on independent of me, I can actually be authentic and truthful in the process. If I'm engaged in a process, 
that has a performance aspect related to it, then I see my self-worth as part of what I expect to accomplish. So athletes are incredible examples of, of uh, type threes. Not that they're the only, I mean, corporate America is a type three. Um, getting things done, being efficient, productive. And it's really not about doing the right thing as much as it is getting it done. So what's the Nike slogan? Just do, look at this, everybody knows the Nike slogan. It's the American slogan. Just do it, you know. We're just trying to get things accomplished. And somehow or another we've lost sight oftentimes of why we're trying to get something done or what the purpose is or what the truth is in all of that. There's some self-deception that can creep in to that process of the just do it, just get her done. So when Holy Hope shows up, it allows for truly experiencing what really needs doing and what does not. Thus, there's no going away from feelings and hence no continuous go-ahead energy and no self-deception. So the role of feelings for a three is very important, are very important to consider. Even though they're part of the heart or feeling triad, their relationship to the outward expression of feelings is that feelings get in the way of getting things done. So it's not just positive or negative feelings, it's all feelings, because guess what? Feelings are messy. Feelings aren't facts. Feelings aren't logic. Feelings are messy. So I take feelings that even though I am a heart type, if I'm a three, and I have that level of sensitivity, I do something with my feelings that says, that say to myself, feelings are going to get in the way of this. I can't, I can't be in the expression of my feelings right now. So again, corporate America, Michael Jordan is a three. I mean, we think of some of the great athletes on the planet, and so many of them are threes. Not that all athletes are threes, but if you're performance driven, that really is kind of a perfect occupation for, for being performance driven. Yes? Mm -hmm. Because sometimes I'm proceeding through life and I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm being authentic. Right. So. Type threes often see themselves as a fraud. They see themselves as a fraud. Okay. And part of what goes on is that it is not, they used to use the word deception for threes. It's self-deception. Oh. It's not deceiving others. It's the deceiving of self. It's the not including self. Well, in order to include yourself in something, you have to show up as all of who you are, including emotionality and all of it, all the messiness. It's not an efficient package to get something done when you really consider all of what's going on if you have a job to get done. And oftentimes threes and sevens, I can't tell you how many threes and sevens I know in my life that have tested highly on Enneagram scores for both types um, because um, there's some fine distinctions and I'll just share one of them that I think is pertinent to uh, 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 the discrimination or discernment between a three and a seven. So type sevens love positive feelings and really will spend a lot of time in positivity and reframing everything to be positive. Um, and so they don't have a pushback against emotion. They have a pushback against negative emotion. Type threes have a pushback against fully embodying the experience of all emotion, positive or negative. I mean, if I get involved in too much bliss in my life, I'm not going to get the job done. It's going to get in the way. Whereas the type seven would go, bring on the bliss, baby. <laughs> I want it. Just leave all the other sour stuff alone. Don't like that at all. So it's not about the emotionality in general. It's about the positive or negative emotionality. That's where, where it shows up. Because emotionality in and of itself interferes with performance or can interfere with performance. It doesn't necessarily need to interfere with performance. But that's the belief. That's the convoluted belief of the three is that it's going to interfere with my ability to perform 
or get something done. And being efficient or productive is driving the boat. So if that's the case, for threes to swim in grace, they may not be in the performance mode all the time. They may need, need to be in a, in a more relaxed state. And if everything in my being is driving me to say I must perform in order to feel good about myself, that's, you can feel the pushback against what it must be like to just be and just sit or just allow. That's not easy. Yes? It strikes me as you describe that, that a three might be prone to the point of view that there is no higher power, that there is no, they're, they're it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very true. The, so the statement was made that the three might have a challenge of seeing a higher power, believing in a higher power, because they may see themselves as the higher power. And I think that, you know, I, I, I can react to that or respond to that statement um, by telling you that as, an, as a person who's been involved in the Enneagram community for years, the, the fewest amount of people in attendance to Enneagram events are threes in general because they're too busy to show up, um, that they suffer oftentimes from workaholism, mm -hmm. that the physical maladies that they experience oftentimes have to do with stress-related illnesses, really strong stress-related illnesses. They're too busy to even consider themselves. Two doesn't consider themselves because they, they judge themselves as needy. A three doesn't consider themselves because they're too busy getting stuff done. So um, finding a place and a practice to relax and to just allow and to just be and I'm, you know, consider, you know, being part of, of that task and workforce. It's, I also find it really interesting that uh, um, I just love this, the, uh, the notion of, of holy hope for three because this free will kind of thing you know, what, what am I actually doing to engage in the process and, 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 and where does the divine process, how am I part of that divine process, requires holy hope for that to be true. One more comment about that. The way that I have to disengage is to go like to a, a, a silent retreat at a monastery. I mean, that's, you know, like your, your point about how Yourself? Uh -huh. It's really interesting. Yeah. So the point was that in order to connect with the spiritual side of yourself, you really have to disconnect and go to a spiritual retreat where there's a silent retreat just to be, yeah. So the lack of distractions perhaps and the lack of anything other than yourself to, act, to be with is what provides you the opportunity to just turn it off. I would say that in that way, a, an approach that a three, as I understand what you just said, would be is that, oh, I'm going to put myself in, I'm, I'm putting myself into the silent meditation, and the purpose of the silent meditation is to have a haws or whatever it is, and so there's that, you know, I'm going to make things happen and type thing that would, when they put them in there, what's expected. That could be. Yeah. 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 So, so let me just re re uh, reframe that for the for the group live streaming. So the notion that that a three might walk into a retreat with a notion of what's expected, how they can be productive, and what they can actually come out of the retreat doing is part of their, uh, and, and hopefully that would relax, yeah. because again, without the I think without the interaction. Um, and the distractions of other things, we, we're trying, all of us are trying to relax the contraction. Now this is a great time to introduce this concept. Once this contraction here is relaxed from any of our types, as the contraction relaxes, we access all the higher qualities of every type, not just our own. So as the contraction of type is released, 
we can see and experience and swim in the grace of the essential qualities of all types. That's where the separation is no longer a separation. Does that make sense? That is grace. That is grace. That is grace. That, there you go. That is grace. Yes. Well, I was just thinking that for an employer, threes are an excellent employee to have. <laughs> and another thing is the, with threes is they, they need kudos, though. Like we have a daughter that is, I, I named her the Dynamo, but um, she's a super achiever. She's a three. But she'll call uh, Renee on the phone and say, Mom, um, I don't know if, this, if, I'm, if they like me or something because they're not giving her kudos. All I have to do is give them some positive reinforcement yeah. and they'll do, yeah. um, sure. break yes. every record there is to break. Yes, yes, yes. So threes require, you know, a lot of esteem and affirmation externally. Yeah, yes, yeah. They're part of the esteem and affirmation triad. So threes, we've talked about great athletes um, and uh, performers, corporate America, getting things done, things like that. And we like to have threes on our team, especially when we have deadlines, because one of the things that they do is they get things done. So our type four, our type four is related to holy origin and equanimity. Equanimity meaning what's going on in the present. Now, again, we take a look at the fact that Staying in the present or being part of the present is a requirement for mindfulness and meditation and all the things that we know that really help our body to calm itself down, to be in, in grace, to swim in the experience of the here and now. It's not that each type doesn't have that challenge, but the four has a belief that through their separation, something is missing. And that separation from their maker, their creator, the divine matrix, whatever you'd like to call it, that separation has left them with this deep, deep longing to return. So holy origin and equanimity means that that this is that in the original state of being, whole and complete connection exists in each moment with nothing of substance or importance missing. Being in this oneness of all creates inner calm. Complete harmony exists with what is present and it's termed equanimity. Gratitude for what's present and appreciation for life positives can abound. In this balanced state, no emotions dominate. The body moves appropriately into life circumstances. Longing goes away and to those things that are only uh, worth pursuing it's the infant in utero actually swimming in the experience of divine presence. So um, everybody also has a challenge of living in the past or the, or the future. We all, like I said, have a problem with being in presence and being in mindfulness. And, and, but the fours are the poster child of how difficult this is. Because the past and the future is always what's going on. And when I'm in a situation right now, I might be longing for the next event, or I might be thinking about something that I regretted or experienced in the past, and staying right here, right now, in the deep appreciation of what is, is the challenge. So swimming in grace for a four requires a practice of presence. And so even though all types can benefit from gratitude practices. When I am working with somebody who identifies as a type four, I, it's, it's at the top of my list. Because in order to experience gratitude, you have to be present. So our fours are very creative and um, can be very eccentric and can be very dramatic. They have an innate capacity to, to delve into and sit in deep emotionality and feel delighted in that. 
Um, they get a bad rap as being called the drama kings and queens of the Enneagram. But the capacity to be in that deep emotionality without being threatened or, or put off by that is a real skill because in our country, we as a, as, as a community have really um, discounted how emotions work in our lives and the value of them. Uh, the, most, the, the most prominent example that I can think of is what we've, what we've done in relationship to honoring people who've just recently gone through a tragedy or a loss or a death. We expect them to be back to work sometimes that day, sometimes three days. I mean, we don't even leave people the space to grieve. And that's a universal experience. You know, I grew up with a, a custom of, of, a, of a space and time where we were given a lot of opportunity to grieve. And I used to question why we did that and how weird that was because it was so out of sync with the culture that I live in at large. And I've really come to appreciate how important that is where grieving is just not only okay, but encouraged. Giving yourself the ability to sit in the discomfort because the only way you can move through it is to go through it. It's not to intellectualize it. It's not to find logic around it. Yes? Um, so I also took that test that I gave him, and I came up as a four. And I completely get what you're saying about being able to, to really sit in the emotion of it, whether it's a good emotion or a bad emotion. But my challenge, personally, is getting stuck there. Like I can, I can go there so easily, but then I end up getting stuck in whatever that mm -hmm. feeling is. Right. Like, especially right. if it's something that is quote unquote a negative feeling. Right. Well, there's a deliciousness and sadness. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, there's, yeah. There's the basking in the sweetness and the deliciousness of melancholy is something that uh, a four can just literally <coughs> find themselves like just enjoying, and. Um, and so finding ways and people and community to pull you out of that yeah. and to engage with you, and that's why this gratitude practices uh, help, help move you out of it, um, are really, really important pieces. Um, and what the real longing for is the reunion and connection with, with that others. where you came from. Yeah. Yeah. It's the deepest part of it is not even with others. It's with your maker or, or with whatever you consider that to be. I hate, I, I, I don't want to use one word because I don't want to leave anybody out here, but where you came from, you know, that from which you came, the source of where you came from is what the separation is more deeply felt in a four. And you never really have been separated. So when we're in that field of grace and that contraction is released, you are reconnected. I always, before any of this, I always so thought myself as a searcher. Like, I've always been searching for something. Mm -hmm. And like you said, it's the connection back with my maker, my yes. or whatever yes. it is. So that's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't like when fours get a bad rap because I think out of all the Enneagram types, sometimes they get a pretty bad rap. But we're so fun. Oh, it's so <laughs> creative. Yes, so creative. So um, that's our, that's our uh, triad um, in relationship to uh, the heart triad and to the need for esteem and affirmation and to the relationship to distress. And so the distress is felt by the separation from, from source. Occupations. Oh, occupations, artists, uh, people who answer suicide hotlines, uh, creative logo de designers, um, uh, graphic artists, um, actors, um, some of the finest actors who just move into a role and live in that role and can take on that role have very, very strong foreness. Um, so do you act? No. <laughs> I'm just wondering. I don't, but I, yeah. I, I am creative. I have an arts background. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, it does yeah, definitely yes. And it's an innate. I have a lot of people who identify as type fours and they'll say, I'm not creative. And then 
they'll, they'll have this incredibly creative expression in their life and they don't even realize it's a creative expression in their life because it's just part of who they are. Yeah. So we're now moving into our final triad, our head triad. And this triad has a direct relationship with fear as fear, as we kind of typically talk about fear. And they're seeking their basic need in accessing grace is finding safety, security, and certainty, and swimming in the fact that we are safe, we are certain, we are secure, and there is nothing that is totally predictable. The predictable and the certain is the uncertain and unpredictable. Because change happens all the time. We live in an ever unfolding and changing universe. And so these three expressions, type 5, 6, and 7, have a particular relationship to, um, and we call it the head triad, to believing that if I gather information uh, and, and I live in some sense of logic or things that make sense, then I am going to mitigate this sense of feeling like there is unpredictability, uncertainty or a lack of safety or there's that I live in a dangerous world and so our fives have done that by seeing that the world feels like it wants too much from them that there's just too many requests too much of a drain I and the, they actually were are the the only no that's not true today they were the first type to have a lot of neurobiological validation for their type, meaning that we um, uh, have done research on type fives. They have a sensitivity to, um, to life that's different than the other types. Yes? Just when you first mentioned this, what first came to mind, and I could be totally off base, is um, like certain conditions like OCD in these types. No. There, this, there are DSM correlates for all the types, and, yeah. and the type 5 is generally not. They are more likely to be a schizoid, a type to withdraw from life, okay. a, a, a type to disengage, a type to become more of an isolator or a hermit, okay. a type that says the world wants too much from me, there's just too much going on, there's too much stimulus, I can't handle this, I need some space, I need to withdraw, I need to pull back. And not because they don't love or want to be part of people, but that it, their just experience of being around is just too muchness. There's a too muchness. So um, I, I oftentimes find people who have either relatives or can relate to a, a type 5, they'll, they'll just go away. And it's not because they don't want to be around the people. They just needed time to kind of replug to themselves, to kind of come back to themselves before they can re-engage in a situation. A turtle? <laughs> yeah, a turtle might be a, a, good, a good kind of uh, example to hold of yourself. And the type 5 has holy om omniscience and non-attachment um, that they've lost sight of. And it means that they, means a direct or transparent inner knowing independent of thoughts and feelings, accompanied by the natural flow of universal energy, which provides ample life energy. So if I know that information exists and there's energy in the world that exists and I can access <coughs> and tap into that, I'm not so worried about people wanting too much from me. Little, little infants exemplify this transparent knowing and natural flow of energy as they live in the present moment without cognition. So cognition or knowing or gathering information is what the five has come to believe is their method and their strategy for managing this, feel, this feeling that life wants too much. If I just had more information, if I just knew more, I could, I could make this feeling go away or this experience go away. Thus, life energy flows freely and uh, freely from and to self termed non-attachment. Consequently, we naturally move forward into life and nurturant and not away. So the, the fives pulling back from life and disengaging and isolating is an attempt 
not to feel overwhelmed. And wisdom and energy occur in everything. A lot of times fives um, can come off as being arrogant because of this really strong notion of being seen as, as, as if, of having information and knowing everything, when in fact it's just that they want you to have that information and they want everybody to have that information and they think that information is absolutely important. And so fives um, oftentimes will will seem to be emotionally detached when in fact they're not emotionally detached. They have emotions as an inner expression and experience in their lives, but it is not an outward expression or experience that others have access to. So brainy, a lot of, we see a lot of brainiacs as fives. Um, a lot of very logical, Bill Gates is a five, I, try, I hate to use people, Warren Buffett is a five. Some of the wealthiest people on the planet are fives. Fives move sometimes at a pace that other people don't understand because they're so busy getting information um, that they um, don't always participate. Um, they're just gathering facts. Yes? They're the hardest part people to sell too. Because when, when I was in the insurance business, I was told this when we were newly trained 45 years ago or something. Don't ever deal with engineers because they can't ever make their mind up because you can't give them enough information. Well, <laughs> so engineers uh, oftentimes are fives. Architects oftentimes are fives. Um, professors oftentimes are fives. That doesn't mean that all engineers, architects, and professors are fives, but you're, you get the idea of what that looks like. So how, what, what would their obstacle look like in terms of swimming in grace? They need to know everything before they do yeah. anything. Yeah, they're so stuck so in their gonna, head. Yeah, they're going to stop and just relax. They have to study why. Well, that the, so the, the question was, would, would they have to stop and study why relaxing is good? They actually have to, in, in, in some ways, similar to a three, but not the, in, the, in the same strategy, they have to just be. They have to just be knowing that knowing is not just about accumulating information, that there are ways of knowing other than just gathering facts. There are ways of assimilating information through the, just pro the process of just being. That wisdom can come from intuition and wisdom can come from the heart. It doesn't just come from, from knowledge and books and things like that. That there's this innate capacity that we have been given in grace in knowing and just knowing just because we came in to this world manifest we have the capacity to know. So that's the obstacle for, for our fives. Our sixes have a relationship to fear. Oh, so the fives, just back to the fives and their relationship to fear, is their way of mitigating fear is to gather more facts. They're just constantly getting more and more and more research and more facts and more facts and more facts and research and more facts and more facts as a way of, of, of avoiding fear. Our sixes um, mitigate fear and, and by a second guessing and self-doubt and playing the devil's advocate and their pros and cons kind of thing. They're looking at all aspects of a situation. Their confidence um, oftentimes is compromised. It means true faith in self, others, and the universe, knowing that nothing destroys essence which underlies all else. It means that nothing, even death, can, can destroy the divine or qualities and the oneness at the core of being. It requires faith. It, faith allows us to meet real danger with a purpose of firmness termed courage. It also means not magnifying danger and examining what could go wrong because sixes mitigate fear through looking at potentially everything that could go wrong, second guessing, self doubt, and playing devil's advocate. In true faith, we recognize responsibility for our own existence 
and in the process of becoming our own authority. Then we naturally face hazardous or fearful situations by going into these and not away from them or against them. So the, the sixth's posture in terms of dealing with fear is to either plunge through it or to back away from it. And the swimming in grace aspect of fear then would be what? If we're not plunging through it or moving away from it, what would grace look like through the posture of a six? Waiting for things to happen to us? Like just expecting anything to come at us, but we're, we're not like seeking it out necessarily. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe the allowing? The allowing things to just kind of be? You know, or just having faith that everything's going to be okay? Right. I mean, what was that Mark Twain quote that you said all the time? <clears throat> that 98% of all his fears never came to pass. Yeah, Mark Twain said that 98% of all of his fears never came to pass. So the things that we fear oftentimes have just, no, nope, never happened. Never happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This holy faith really becomes, you know, just really important in this process of swimming in grace. Yeah. Sixes have a very interesting relationship to authority. So they either have a very devout um, kind of respect for authority or they challenge authority. Um, and so, uh, and, and sometimes they can do both. You know, you can see them change their posture of really, I respect authority and then I'm just gonna kind of, kind of go up against and challenge authority. Um, sixes are, are, are often great first responders, uh, policemen and firemen. Um, they're dutiful and they're very dependable and they have a strong tendency to have to be social activists and take a position and trying to help the world become a better place sometimes being uh, confused with our ones um, but they have an, a, a desire to to make to make the world safer and a better place um, Good Uber drivers. <laughs> That's funny. I have to think about that one. I, I might have to need some time to process that. But they certainly. Um, the first responder. The first responder. Oh, the first responder part of it, I see. Yeah. They're also great military personnel in terms of their devout um, uh, commitment to loyalty and patriotism and things like that. Our sevens. Our sevens. Um, we talked about the word holy work and holy sobriety. Um, sobriety, again, not meaning that we're abstinent from mood. This is the only type that's abstinence, abstinent from mood-altering substances. And when you hear this definition, it will help that. It means embracing all of life with focused concentration and the ability to travel the spectrum of consciousness fully and freely which allows for staying in the present moment with steadfast constancy, constancy term sobriety. So staying present to what's going on. And so unlike the four, which is past and future focused, the seven is future focused. What's next? What's next? What's next? What's next? And so that's, it, it, there's, a, there's a very, very fast paced energy and it's uh, always focused on what's, what's next. And so there also is a notion of needing to be present and appreciative of what's going on now, but not because they can't access appreciation in the same way a four can, but because appreciation is going to slow them down from what's next. I could appreciate what's a possibility. And so this notion of needing options is, is hugely important. In order for this to happen, a seven must embrace pain and sadness as well as pleasure and joy with an open heart to both others and self in the present moment. A gluttony of the mind for endless future possibilities and adventure stops when you're in the present. 
and there's a fully grounded experiencing the full spectrum of life, including the dimensions of inner life, which are not always positive. We have to access, access the pain and the suffering. So the seven's pushback against that is the belief that if I go into the pain and the suffering, I won't come out of it. Um, so what would be obstacles for our sevens? Focusing on getting anything done. Focusing on getting anything done. Staying with the task and completing it. Because it's boring. Sometimes, you know, when we start things, it's fresh and it's exciting and it's new and it's filled with, like, verve and just feels, like, energetic. And yet, sticking with something and getting it completed can feel ew and ordinary and suffocating. And so knowing that things, the completion of things is not going to take you under and there can be a sense of satisfaction is um, really, really important. Life of the party. Yeah, you know, they're also the life of the party. They like to have fun. And sometimes, you know, the making lemonade out of lemons kind of circumvents the ability to move through the difficulties. And so your difficulties are always, always just sitting there because you've never moved through them. You've just kind of moved them around or put them under the rug or, or made lemonade and, and never realized that, yeah, that lemon is kind of sour. Yes. Yes. So the fear expressed in the five is to gather, and we do that by gathering information. The fear expressed in the six is to play the devil's advocate, to look at the pros and cons of everything. If I look at the pros and cons and I know what could potentially go wrong, I feel like I can mitigate my fear. Thank you for that question. And the seven is if I know what my options are, I feel like my, my fear kind of goes away. As long as there's options and possibilities, everything's good. As long as you take those away from me, everything's bad. If I have to go into the pain and suffering around something, it's not good. So I deal with fear. So the obstacle, of course, is, you know, we live in a world where we can constantly get ourselves distracted, start new things, never finish. They're great. Uh, sevens are great idea people. They're great optimists. They're great for reframing. Uh, they're great motivational speakers, and they're great salespeople. Um, not that, uh, again, lots of other people can't be great salespeople either, but they always are into the next thing and they have great energy. Um, one of the things about sevens and threes is a lot of times their meditation or mindfulness practices involve constant movement. They can run and meditate. They can be moving and meditate. They can actually be slowed down through movement. Their central nervous systems can be calm through movement. There's not too many other types that can do that. Yes. And our last type is, um, we talked about eights? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we did, we did talk about eights. Yeah. Yes, good. Good, so I want, to t I want to talk a little bit about the benefits of grace. Um, so grace awakens us. It, it transforms our pain into joy. It helps us guide our purpose. It can stir compassion. It can free us from our thinking, thinking, thinking minds into our just swimming in grace. It helps us create a larger perspective. It helps us with unconditional positive regard and love. It relaxes our body and our mind. Feels good. It increases our energy. It gives us courage. 
It allows effortless success. It awakens us to abundance. Provides flexibility and perseverance. And oneness and creativity. And as I said those words, we could take them all around the Enneagram. This was from an article of, about grace on, on the internet that I found in terms of all these benefits. And I'm going, oh my God, I, I could probably spend an afternoon talking about how grace helps with perseverance of a particular type and creativity of another type. And so stay tuned for a full day presentation on grace as it relates to type in a more specific way. And I'd like to end today with um, something that is uh, in the um, Lotus Sutra. So it's a meditation, so I'd like you to unravel yourself again. And focus on your breathing and take your attention inside. Take three slow, deep breaths. And now take three slow, deeper breaths. Taking your And this is called the parable of the gem in the robe. Some of you may have heard this before. A poor man visited a wealthy friend and the two enjoyed conversation. Years passed, difficult years for the poor man who traveled far and wide searching for food and clothing to keep himself alive unaware that in the lining of his robe he carried a priceless jewel. After many years, he once again met his friend, who was astonished that he still lived in poverty. The friend showed him the jewel sewn in his robe, and the poor man was filled with gratitude and joy knowing that he would never go hungry again. We are like that poor man. Think of a time that you received a gift that you didn't recognize in that moment. Maybe it was the first time you fell in love. Maybe it was a piece of advice. Maybe it was meeting a new friend or a decision to take one path instead of another. But they've all brought you to where you are today. Our entire lives are filled with these inconspicuous moments of grace. Times when we are presented with choices or opportunities to recognize a gift in our lives. Today, what are the moments of grace in your life? The events that change the course of your life? They aren't the milestones. They're also the subtle moments that resulted in your journey being what it has been. Moments without which our lives might have been remarkably different for better or for worse. Reflect on your moments of grace. What are the jewels in your pocket that you didn't know were there? What gifts have you received along the way that have brought you to this time and place in your life?
bring your attention and awareness to your eyes that let you see the color, smiles, faces, nature, the sunrise, the sunset, the rainbow, the moon and the stars, or allow you to see yourself in the mirror. Now bring your awareness to your ears that beam in sound, music, laughter, and the voices of those you love, the silence and the beautiful sounds of life. Now bring your awareness to your nose that smells the ocean breeze, the aroma of sweetness, the flowers, the trees, newly cut grass, the wafting smells that come from the kitchen, cupcakes and cookies in the oven. Bring your awareness to your lips and mouth, the tastes that you savor, the tastes that nourish, the mouth that kisses and speaks that whispers and sings. Bring your awareness to your hands that hold and touch, that caress, that open and close and applaud and squeeze. And now your arms and shoulders that carry and hug and lift and stretch. And now bring your attention to your feet, your toes, the gift to wiggle them, transport you, help you walk, run, dangle, dance, kick, fold, leap and point. What about your tears, your sorrows and the strength that you seem to be able to muster to make it through each day? Bring your awareness to your abundance, your expansion, your evolution. The flow and empathy of love and light and your ability to see growth and potential in each moment. Just breathe and feel more grace and ease. When we no longer take life for granted, we come, become grateful for everything that we have. And within this, we access grace. Just breathe and feel this flow. And when you're ready, come back to the room. So I thank you for allowing me to learn from you and be with you and teach what I have found out about grace on my journey and to have this experience to encourage me to stay on my journey because we do all need more grace in our life. There is no doubt that every one of us could, could benefit from having more grace in our life. And I, think, I really thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.